We are halfway through the Bill of Rights, and I admit that researching the amendments to make certain that I understood what they say has been interesting. I hope that you enjoyed reviewing the amendments and what they mean in America. Hopefully my American friends now understand and appreciate their rights a little more, and my overseas friends understand a little better why Americans insist on rights which are guaranteed here, but perhaps not elsewhere. Having said that, let's dig in again. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right of a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district where the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. The Sixth Amendment works together with the Fifth and the Fourth to define personal rights and judicial proceedings. These protections seem basic to some people, so I'm going to provide some examples of trials in which they applied. When our society discusses issues politely, with each side seeking a peaceful resolution, everyone benefits. When the discussion is a highly polarized shouting match between people who just don't listen to each other, well, it's time for some roasted opinions. The right of a speedy trial is a protection against perpetually looming accusations upending one's entire life. Think of a trial as a test to prove or disprove an accusation. It's important to ensure that the trial is fair to both accuser and accused. Does an innocent person deserve to have an unnecessarily protracted trial, especially in a listen and believe culture? Depending on the severity of the allegation, the accused may find themselves ostracized and in financial difficulty. An innocent person certainly doesn't deserve this, and our legal system presumes innocence until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. A speedy trial, therefore, is necessary to minimize the negative impact of the accusation and subsequent trial for an accused innocent. It's also proper for those who are guilty, too. If a capital crime like murder has occurred, finding the murderer quickly is important to protect the people from harm. The accused must be brought to court as swiftly as possible, given the limitations of a building a case through investigation and crafting a defense. If we are talking about a felony, then the crime is serious enough that a speedy trial is still necessary to preserve the rule of law. Contrary to what various anarchists might claim, society will not function without protections against theft, fraud, assault, and other predatory actions. Speedy trials serve both the public good by getting criminals off the streets and by keeping unproven allegations from lingering. If we were speaking about misdemeanors though, then a speedy trial actually makes the most sense. A misdemeanor is a crime, but it's the sort of a crime which does much less harm to others. Misdemeanors do not necessarily indicate that the person is going to engage in a pattern of criminal misconduct. There's a much greater chance that one conviction will be enough to cause a change in behavior. Ergo, the penalties are much less. Many misdemeanor fines can be paid off entirely with one payment. Time spent in jail might be short enough that the whole sentence may be served without losing one's employment or devastating one's finances. If the penalty for the crime is, say, an 800 pound fine, then it's a misdemeanor. In America, such a trial would take a few months at most because of the right of a speedy trial. In Great Britain, though, ask Mark Meachin, aka Count Dankula, about being arrested on 8th of May 2016, yet not convicted until 20th of March 2018 nor sentenced until 23rd of April 2018, nearly two full years after his arrest. The maximum penalty for the offense involved was six months imprisonment and a fine of up to 10,000 pounds. Meachin was fined 800 pounds, partly because the standard fine system is designed to impose proportionate fines based on individual income and repayment within 12 months in the United Kingdom. That's a fine of just over a thousand US dollars, making it roughly a class A misdemeanor in most US jurisdictions. Whether or not you agree that Meachin committed a crime, should anyone face two years of continuance after continuance by the prosecution for a misdemeanor? Um, no. Just, no. Public trials are the second guaranteed right. In America, this has two similar effects. 
The defendant has the right to be tried in public with few exceptions, so that all the proceedings may be observed in order to protect the rights of the accused, and the public at large has a right to attend the trial in order to learn about and report upon the proceedings. Only under extraordinary circumstances such as attempts to disrupt proceedings is the right to a public trial suspended, and even in those cases the prosecution and defendant both have a right to access to all witnesses and evidence associated with the trial with some exceptions, which I will address in a few minutes. The trial of Stephen Yaxley Lennon, aka Tommy Robinson, for filming outside of a courthouse violated both of these principles. Under British law, no reporting is allowed on trial proceedings once a gag order is in place. Also, Robinson's subsequent trial for contempt, conviction, and sentencing was gagged so thoroughly by the court that media outlets had to challenge the gag order just to be able to report that he had been arrested and that proceedings had progressed to sentencing already. Whether you agree with Yaxley Lennon's conviction or not, should he have had a public trial, and should he have been able to protest outside of the courthouse? In America, we have both of these rights, thanks to the Sixth Amendment. Every criminal defendant has a right to trial by jury in America, with very few exceptions. Juvenile courts do not have jury trials as a trade-off for lighter sentencing guidelines, including the juvenile's right to have their record expunged upon reaching adulthood. Violations and lesser misdemeanor offenses are not required to provide a trial by jury under the Constitution, as this places an unnecessary burden upon the court. Imagine providing a separate impartial jury along with all the attendant hearings, delays, and costs for a parking ticket. Jury trials for civil cases are a separate matter, covered under the Seventh Amendment, but we will get there in another video. A notable circumstance in which the right to a jury trial becomes a problem occurred during the global war on terrorism with the captured insurgents. Under the international laws governing armed conflict, the bulk of insurgents captured during the war were technically not soldiers, but civilians. Their actions were criminal in the United States, but not necessarily in the countries where they were captured. This created several problems, including the fact that if they were tried under U.S. law, they were entitled to juries formed from locals where they attacked Americans. Handing them over to local authorities in Afghanistan and Iraq risked them being released and returned to insurgent operations, though. So the U.S. faced a complex legal dilemma over jurisdiction, jury trials, previously ascertained state and district, and other provisions. The matter of how to deal with these individuals justly in accordance with law has yet to be fully resolved. The jury must be drawn from the state and district where the crime was committed as well. This provision has created a few circumstances in which a serious crime could, in theory at least, be unprosecutable. Take Bullfrog County, Nevada, for instance. From 1987 to 1989, this county existed around Yucca Mountain, Nevada, site of the nuclear waste repository. The entire county was uninhabited for the duration of its existence, the only such county to exist in the history of the United States. A jury could not be formed from no population, so a person charged with a felony could theoretically have asked for a jury trial and placed the court in a quandary, as denial of a jury trial in felony cases resulted in an automatic acquittal in the U.S. Thankfully, this did not occur, but the potential for this situation still exists, which leads into the next point. Jurisdictions must be previously ascertained for criminal trials. They cannot be changed between crime and prosecution because doing so might change the outcome of the trial. This is not to say that a change of venue is illegal, as indeed sometimes a change of venue is necessary. But in those circumstances, specific provisions are made under the law. Jurisdiction is important, but jurisdictions may overlap. In a notable case of multiple jurisdictions, the officers who were charged in the Rodney King case were acquitted of assault in state court but two were later convicted of violating King's civil rights in federal court. All parties of a court case must be properly informed, especially of the accusation grounds in criminal cases. This is why police officers must inform suspects of what crime is involved when making an arrest. This is also why indictments and other legal documents involved in a criminal case must be served properly to a defendant, and why process servers can be called into a hearing to testify about the service of those documents. This principle also applies to civil lawsuits. When Carl Benjamin, aka Sargon of Akkad, was sued by Akila Hughes, aka Akila obviously, there was a notable question regarding the service of legal documents to Benjamin. 
The request for summary judgment against Benjamin was dismissed based upon the fact that Benjamin had not been properly served with notice of the lawsuit. Hughes retained a new attorney after this decision. A final decision is still pending at this time. The accused in criminal proceedings also retains the right to be confronted with witnesses against him or her. This sets two important legal precedents. It protects the accused person's access to cross-examine his or her accusers, and it prevents trial in absentia. Naturally, there are a few limited exceptions to these protections. The accused may not attempt to use these rights to intimidate witnesses or to avoid the trial by failing to appear after the process has begun. Still, these protections are important enough that notably absent persons such as Julian Assange and Edward Snowden, against whom charges have been brought, may not be tried for any crimes in the U.S. until and unless they return to the U.S., whether voluntarily or involuntarily. It makes the indictments against Russians for interfering in the 2016 election effectively moot. This also applies to physical evidence. The accused has a right to be confronted with the evidence to be submitted to the court. This means that they have the right to evaluate the evidence independently and to cross-examine any experts involved with the gathering and testing of that evidence. Evidence may not be submitted without the opportunity to speak to these experts. In most cases, the accused does appear and is brought to trial. They have access to two distinct benefits during the trial not previously mentioned. Compulsory process and assistance of counsel. Brady v. Maryland notably established in 1963 that this applies to any and all exculpatory evidence discovered in the course of the investigation. The prosecution may not withhold evidence, unintentionally or deliberately. While Brady was not retried to determine his guilt, he was resentenced due to his partner's admission to committing the murder in question on his own, resulting in Brady getting off of death row. This would not have been possible for Brady without the assistance of counsel, the final right guaranteed by the Sixth Amendment. There have been numerous cases addressing this right decided by the Supreme Court. In the original trial, the accused must have access to competent counsel, free from conflict of interest and of the defendant's choice, for all major hearings. The accused does not have to pay for that counsel if they are unable to afford their fees. The accused may represent themselves if they are competent to do so, to the satisfaction of the court, in all original trial proceedings. They must have access to counsel for appeals, though. All of these protections are there so that the accused has a fair trial free from unnecessary delays and legal trickery designed to obtain an unjust conviction. Effectively, it defines due process in criminal cases, something which the 14th Amendment later guaranteed to every American. Now that's just my opinion, and you don't have to agree with me. In fact, I'd love to hear what you think, so go ahead and give me a like or dislike and comment below. If you like this content and want to see more, feel free to subscribe and make sure that you ring the notification bell. New episodes of Roasted Opinions post on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Join me on the last Saturday of each month where I invite guests to join me in the kitchen. New content is coming, so watch this space.